Hello and welcome everyone. Today we'll be discussing about cardiogenic shock. This presentation will be covering the definition, the underlying mechanisms, the different types and stages of cardiogenic shock, the clinical presentation and the diagnostic criteria, the current management strategies, and the mechanical circulatory support devices. So what is cardiogenic shock? It is defined as a condition where the heart cannot pump enough oxygenated blood to meet the body's metabolic demands despite adequate fluid volume. The consequence of this is it that leads to end organ hypoperfusion, meaning vital organs like the kidneys, brain and the liver do not receive enough oxygen and nutrition. The pathophysiology, the overview is the primary cardiac dysfunction is there because of which the heart's pumping ability is reduced. So this reduces the cardiac output that is less blood is circulating throughout the body. Then we have compensatory mechanism that the body attempts to compensate by constricting the blood vessels which can worsen the organ dysfunction. Finally we have systemic effects that is all this will trigger a systemic inflammatory response leading to multi-organ failure. So what are the types of cardiogenic shock? The most common one that is around 90% is acute myocardial infarction related which occurs when the heart attack causes severe cardiac dysfunction. The other causes are valvular disorders and other things. The other condition is normotensive cardiogenic shock. In this, the patient has a normal blood pressure that is the SPP is more than 90 but it shows signs of low cardiac output and high filling pressures. So how do we manage acute myocardial infarction? The current treatment guidelines is early invasive angiography to visualize the blocked arteries, a PCI to reopen the blocks, use of vasopressors, anotopes and careful fluid management. In normotensive, it is characterized by a normal blood pressure but the signs of heart failure and hypoperfusion are seen. Patient can deteriorate rapidly even if the blood pressure is being maintained. The key insight over here is blood pressure alone isn't always sufficient to diagnose cardiogenic shock. So there is a revised criteria for cardiogenic shock for a broad, more broader description. It includes patients with signs of hypoperfusion even without low blood pressure. So the focus is on organ perfusion, the importance of detecting poor organ delivery to the tissues. So there is a role of invasive hemodynamic monitoring Pressures like PCWP help in assessing the heart's function. In clinical trials, studies have suggested that invasive tests aren't always necessary for diagnosis. In the guidelines, however, selective use of invasive monitoring without delaying critical treatments like revascularization must be done. But if you have the time and you have the opportunity, it is always better to go for invasive monitoring so that you can understand what are the cardiac parameters. Hemodynamic changes. Low cardiac output with high filling pressure. It results in poor perfusion, worsens the ischemia. The compensatory mechanisms are vasoconstriction and systemic inflammation. The clinical impact is that it leads to a vicious cycle of worsening heart function and organ perfusion. In clinical presentation, the signs of hyperperfusion are cool extremities, altered mental status, decreased urine output in lab tests, you can look for elevated lac lactate levels, changes in the oxygen saturation measurement and finally renal and kidney function disorders. So for early identification we have the three windows to the microcirculation being the skin, the brain and the kidney. Out of this, these two are primarily the most important one which you should be looking for when the patient is coming to the emergency or the ICU. If the patient is cold and altered, then please think that the patient could be having hypoperfusion. So next we have the SCAI shock severity staging. In stage A, the at-risk patients that is large MI but the hemodynamics are stable. In stage B, beginning of shock with hypotension, but no hypoperfusion. In stage C, there is classic shock with hypotension and hypoperfusion. In stage T, that is deterioration despite initiation of the treatment. 
in stage E, it is extreme with severe organ dysfunction and severe hemodynamic instability. Key lab markers that we can look are the lactate levels. Elevated lactate indicate a tissue hypoperfusion, oxygen saturations that is SVO2 mixed venous and central venous oxygen saturations help us in assessing the oxygen delivery and its consumption. Additional markers are the ABG, base excess, creatinine, urine output, ACTALT in the liver function, NT pro BNK and troponins for heart failure and myocardial injury. The incidence, acute myocardial infarction, myocarditis, valvular heart disease, acute decompensated heart failure, all these are the common causes of cardiogenic shock. In the mortality rate, it's around for acute myocardial infarction, it is around 40 to 50 percent. In uh, the acute decompensated heart failure, similar mortality and often requires longer hospital stay. Management strategy. Immediate revascularization if it is acute myocardial infarction. The evidence is very strong for early revascularization. Guidelines recommend to do it immediately. Regarding the revascularization guidelines, ESC, that is the European Society, says it's a class 1 recommendation for immediate angio and ECI. The culprit shock trial insight shows that initial PCI should focus on the culprit artery only to reduce the procedure time and the contrast exposure. These patients need to be stabilized as early as possible. So stent the culprit artery, send the patient to the monitoring place and using less contrast because the more number of stents I like to put, I will be using more contrast which will increase my AKI risk. It always needs a multidisciplinary approach that is cardiologist, cardiac surgeons and with them the role of intensivist is going to be very very important. The benefit is that it helps us in early identification, individualized treatment plans and improves adherence to the guidelines. Current practice is, to, is often inconsistent, dedicated teams are needed to address these issues. Cardiac arrest in cardiogenic shock, it is an indicator of severity of the cardiac status. The prevalence is around 50% of cardiogenic shock result in a cardiac arrest. The cause being the underlying heart condition and the myocardial stunning due to the oxygen deprivation. Here the role of electric uh, the extracorporeal cardiopulmonary resuscitation that is ECPR is done supports patients who do not regain the circulation within the standard CPR. The mechanism it provides circulatory and respiratory support by the VA ECMO. The evidence is mixed ongoing trials aim to clarify the benefits but for all practical purposes it is a alternative which can be tried in salvageable patients or patients who are young with less comorbidities. In the supportive management, reduce the preload by stusamide, diuretics, the afterload you need to titrate with vasopressors and vasodilators as and when required. The goal is to optimize the cardiac output and tissue perfusion while minimizing the adverse effects. So the general supportive treatment, blood glucose control to prevent hyperglycemia induced complications, adequate oxygen delivery, uh, stress as a prophylaxis, early enteral feeding anti-thrombotic agents like antiplatelets and anticoagulations are very very important. So the treatment part is divided over here. The volume optimization by fluid resuscitation and diuretics. You have to titrate this. Vasoconstriction and vasodilatation. Again you have to titrate this and increasing the contractility. For volume optimization we, if it is hypervolumia we give fluids. If it is hypervolumia we will give diuretics. So this is where it works. It will reduce the intravascular volume. In the vasoconstrictor, we have epinephrine that is a norepinephrine as well as vasopressins. These act on the endothelium and cause vasoconstriction. The vasodilators that we use are nitroprusside, nitroglycerin, very secute, and all these things act again on the C cyclic GMP and cause a vasodilatation. The contractility is improved by dobutamine epinephrine, milrinone, levosimendan, which act on the cells and improve the contractility. So uh, despite all the measures, sometimes the patients still are unable to maintain their circulation for which we use the mechanical circulatory devices. 
They provide a temporary support to the failing heart. The type of support are partial or complete. Some devices also offer respiratory support. In the clinical scenario, it can be a bridge to decision for the patient, a bridge to recovery, a bridge to durable support or transplantation. So the types of uh, mechanical circulatory support devices, the most common one and the old one is the intraatic balloon pump. It enhances the coronary perfusion and reduces the upload. Then we have the impeller devices. It's a microaxial flow pump that unloads the left ventricle. The tandem heart, it is something which provides right atrial to arterial support. The protect duo, which is the right ventricular support by the internal jugular. And uh, finally, with also the respiratory support, we have the VA ECMO. So coming first to the intraartic balloon pump, the mechanism is that it inflates during the diastole and increases the blood flow to the heart, deflates during the systole to reduce the workload on the heart. The advantage is that it is cost effective, easy to insert. The limitations being there is no significant benefit in trials that have been done. So it is less used until unless the patients are in having some mechanical complications. The impeller device, it pumps blood from the left ventricle into the ascending aorta. If the types are there are various types available based on the flow that they can generate and the consideration over here is it provides a higher flow rates in newer models and the complications can include bleeding hemolysis and limb ischemia uh, tandem heart and protect duo these are left atrial to femoral artery bypass and require a transeptal puncture and the protect duo is it is inserted by the right internal jugular and it can include an oxygenator for respiratory support. The VA ECMO, uh, the mechanism over here is it circulates the blood to an oxygenator and back into arterial circulation. The indication being refractory cardiogenic shock, cardiac arrest, biventricular failure, the limitations here being that high risk of bleeding and vascular complications. Recent trials show no significant benefit of using this in acute myocardial infarction. So these are the right heart support devices that we have, the impella right side, Flex the tandem heart RAPA. This is the tandem heart. This is the PA ECMO for the right heart. For the left heart, we have a lot of devices. The IABP. This is the impella, which will decongest the left ventricle. The tandem heart, the PA ECMO, and the combination of impella with ECMO that is called the ECMELA. So how do we choose the right uh, mechanical circulatory device? Assess the patient's need, the hemodynamic profile, which part of the heart is failing, the presence of any respiratory failure. Regarding the device selection, the VA ECMO is suitable if there is biventricular failure or cardiac arrest. Impella is better for isolated left ventricular failure. Other considerations are institutional experience and of course the resources that are available and the potential risk and complications that are potentially using. So this is a table which summarizes all the devices that are available, their sizes, the contraindications, their ability to oxygenate the blood and the recommended maximum uses duration. So what, there are some challenges that we have with the mechanical circulatory devices that is there is limited evidence, lack of consistent benefits and the complications like bleeding, limb ischemia, hemolysis, so the management needs are careful anticoagulation protocol and close monitoring of the device related complications. So to summarize, cardiogenic shock is a life threatening condition requiring prompt recognition and intervention. Early re revascularization is crucial in acute myocardial infarction related cardiogenic shock. Pharmacological support and mechanical devices play a key role in the management over here. Multidisciplinary team is important for giving comprehensive care. And ongoing research is essential to optimize the treatment and improve survival rates.